Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, it's the Friday News Roundup. I'm with CityCast Mallory Falk and Elizabeth Kama talking about all the stories we couldn't get enough of this week. It's Friday, February 2nd. I'm Morgan Moody, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. This week, we are joined by our our, our podcast regulars, I guess. Uh, (laughs) Lead producer, Mallory Falk. Hey, Morgan. And audio producer, Elizabeth Kama. Hi Morgan. Hi Hello. Mallory. Hello. I'm I'm a little under the weather, so I'm breathing in uh, some different vapors. I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting high on uh, <laughs> on like some uh, some fruits and and herbs and uh, <laughs> me- other herbal medicinal things. But uh, Mallory, what else is going on in the medicinal world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, some people are turning to things other than fruits. So uh, back in 2016, Pennsylvania legalized medical marijuana. It's continued to add new conditions over the years that make you eligible to get a medical marijuana card. And I'm curious, a little pop quiz for you. What do you think is the leading reason that people get approved for cards these days? I guess like when I think about um, the effect marijuana has on the body, I would assume it would be pain because I know that like it's or like insomnia, something along those lines, because I know from what research I've done, that that tends to be like really effective um, as a treatment for those conditions. Yeah, Elizabeth, that's a good guess. And for a while, that actually was the leading reason uh, people Mm. got approved was chronic pain. But that's actually changed. Um, In 2019, Pennsylvania's health secretary approved anxiety disorders as a qualifying condition here. Pennsylvania's actually only one of a few states where anxiety counts as a qualifying condition for uh, medical cannabis. Huh. And Ed Mahone at Spotlight PA just released a big story uh, where he analyzed 1.1 million cannabis certification records mm. and found that... Um, That's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah, he found that anxiety disorders now dominate or are now the leading reason people uh, get approved for medical marijuana. I guess I shouldn't be as surprised as I am when like COVID happened, a lot of people are at home, you know, experimenting, feeling anxious. Um, I was living in New York for a lot of the pandemic where marijuana is decriminalized. um, And I knew a lot of people who turned to the substance to just kind of cope with the general malaise of COVID-19 and isolation. Yeah, I think we're just generally a very anxious society um, as is. So then how does this work? Like, does this mean uh, it's relatively easy to get this diagnosis and get a medical marijuana card? Because we can have like states of anxiety or we can Mm. be wrapped Mm -hmm. by anxiety. Yeah. So there's debate about this. I mean, some people are saying that this anxiety disorder category has essentially created a loophole this way for almost anyone to get approved for medical marijuana, regardless of whether they have an anxiety disorder or not in a state where, you know, recreational use isn't legal, at least not yet. Um, One expert told Ed that if you say anxiety disorder, those are like the magic words to get approved. Mm. Um, But also, yeah, I mean, Elizabeth, you mentioned like anxiety rates have risen during COVID and, you know, for a number of other reasons. And, you know, one expert said to Ed that the story here is that there's a lot of people with anxiety who are hurting right now and want help. He said that's the story, and he doesn't see this being a story about, like, an abuse of a government program for people to get high. Those are are the words this expert used. Wait, so if people are are using this as a loophole or if that's kind of like a theory that some people have, does it mean that it's easy to get approved? So according to Ed's reporting, yes. Uh, In Pennsylvania, there isn't a ton of oversight of medical marijuana doctors. Sometimes these doctors are the ones making that initial diagnosis for anxiety, And these can be like pretty quick appointments where doctors are just like, yep, you qualify, you're good to go, you're Mm. approved for this card. Um, There are actually medical marijuana card companies that are actively courting clients, as Ed puts it, who uh, don't have a prior diagnosis or medical records showing that they have an anxiety disorder. Uh, There's one called Elevate Holistics that has a section on their website titled How to Get a Medical Card Without a Condition and like actually uses the word loophole. It basically like describes anxiety disorders as a loophole in Pennsylvania's medical marijuana law. 
I get that there's a concern here that uh, this is going to be used as a loophole for people who just want to use marijuana recreationally and, and see this as a way to do that. I don't know that that is necessarily... Uh, hopefully that's not the bulk of... Um, <laughs> you know, applications that they get for these cards. But are mm-hmm. there other, are there any other concerns for uh, people trying to get their their medical marijuana um, card? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some doctors and experts who who might actually even support like wide scale cannabis legalization, um, who see the benefits of using cannabis to treat anxiety. Um, But they have concerns that the way this process works in Pennsylvania means that some people who, you know, really do have anxiety disorders that they need treatment for might not be getting the best care. Um, They might just be getting like a quick sign off on this treatment without getting all the information about it or exploring other options or things that would be helpful alongside using cannabis, like counseling or therapy. Mm. Um, You know, as far as I can tell, it seems like there isn't really consensus yet around using cannabis to treat anxiety. Mm -hmm. And some of this is just because there are federal restrictions that have limited cannabis research, Um, though actually President Biden signed legislation that basically expands medical marijuana research. So hopefully that'll start to change and and there's more opportunity to to really study um, if and how this can be helpful. But, you know, there are some concerns that some types of cannabis might actually worsen anxiety symptoms. And so it's just important for people who are really looking for some relief from anxiety to just have all the information they need to make, you know, informed decisions about their treatment plans, Mm -hmm. which I think there's concern that if you're going Finding a doctor through one of these, there's these like third party companies and you're just getting like a quick uh, appointment, you might not be getting all that information. And so, you know, even if you're not concerned about grown adults finding a loophole to access something that's already legal in some of our neighboring states, you know, right. even if they don't have an anxiety disorder, mm-hmm. um, this might feel like a more legitimate concern of just wanting to make sure people are getting like the care and the information that they need. Yeah, paranoia is something that's associated with certain like strains or types of marijuana. Um, Been there, so, <laughs> yeah. so I don't. I'm not. Yeah, I, I was don't like, know can confirm. That would be a great way, <laughs> right. uh, can someone. confirm edible edibles do not help your anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe look into it. But speaking of legalization, um, is there any chance PA might legalize marijuana for recreational use anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, some people are saying 2023 is the year. Democrats should be controlling the House. We know there's some drama with that right now. We've covered it on the pod before, (laughs) but um, special elections are coming up really soon. And everyone assumes Dems will win those vacant seats and take control of the House. And it's generally been Republican lawmakers holding up legalization. So that could change things. Our new Democratic governor, Josh Shapiro, supports legalization. Mm. Um, And like I said, some neighboring states have already legalized it. New York, New Jersey, it's becoming legal in Maryland this summer. As like neighboring states continue to make this legal, I don't know, it seems like it's only a matter of time, but I guess we'll kind of keep our eyes on on efforts to legalize it in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, I... It's interesting to think about how it's changed uh, in Pennsylvania just in my lifetime. Um, I also want to shout out like an episode that I had no personal hand in, um, but I really enjoyed just as a listener, which is um, when we talked to Ed about uh, medical marijuana certification companies, like misleading some customers around opioid use disorder and how marijuana can treat it. Um, We'll link to that episode Mm. in the show notes uh, and to the rest of his reporting. He's a really fantastic um, reporter, and he's been doing a lot of great coverage of medical marijuana for Spotlight PA. Um, And all of that will be in our show notes. CityCast listeners, newsletter editor Francesca DeBecco here. Do you want to get your message out in the Berg? You should advertise with us. CityCast Pittsburgh reaches the locals who care most about what's going on around town. Our listeners and readers are the dedicated residents who live and breathe all things Steel City. They're looking for new restaurants, attending local events, and proud to be politically and socially engaged. Learn more at citycast.fm forward slash advertise or email us at ads at citycast.fm. Speaking of anxiety, Pittsburgh's bridges, they cause me a lot of anxiety. Yeah, this city and its bridges, it's 
ongoing saga. This could really be um, a, a soap opera. I'm, I'm now imagining taking an edible and trying to cross a bridge, and I feel like that would only <laughs> lead to a disaster. That's why you needed to consult with a, a doctor. A, doctor <laughs> a licensed you, professional. A licensed professional to get your medical marijuana card. Um, it's been almost exactly one year since the Fern Hollow Bridge collapsed, and almost a year later. Thankfully, no collapse, but there is another one of the city's bridges that's closed because it's considered unsafe for drivers. Uh, the Charles Anderson Memorial Bridge, it's in Oakland. It was closed immediately to traffic on Wednesday. It crosses over um, the Valley of Panther Hollow if you're familiar with that mm, area. Right, yeah. right. Uh, it's very busy. It's an 85-year-old bridge, so it's very busy for its age. Um, <laughs> but it's at the end of Shenley Park. It connects like three or four different neighborhoods. It connects Greenfield and Squirrel Hill to downtown in Oakland. So it It's an important bridge. And a very important bridge. It carries a lot of traffic. But, you know, I mean, one could argue equally as important and connecting as, as the Fern Hollow Bridge was, you know, at its time. Um, at its time, that sounds like it was put out to pasture. <laughs> but, you know, it's got a new face, but yeah. uh, we remember the original. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> according to the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, drivers are going to have to find another route uh, for at least the next four months, while millions of dollars in repairs are going to have to be made. But the bridge right now is still open to pedestrians and bikers. I don't know. To me, I feel like if a bridge is close to cars, I don't know if I would want to walk across it. <laughs> what's, the, what's the explanation there for why it can be open for some for foot and uh, bike traffic, but not cars? I feel the same way. Um, yeah, if you're telling me that I can't drive over it, I'm definitely not walking over it. I think I have a chance of surviving if I uh, drive a little faster. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's do the logic here. How heavy is a car compared to a human being? Right. And, and that's really the math the, is nothing. Yeah, the math is mathing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the chief engineer for the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, Eric Seltzer, said that an October inspection found that some of the bridge components had thinned due to corrosion. Mm. Both the superstructure and the substructure were rated in poor condition, and the deck was just considered fair. So that's basically why people can still walk across <laughs> it like the decks. It's okay, you know, <laughs> hanging in there. It's hanging in there. Um, you know, we had that report from the city's bridge assessment management team last year. Mm -hmm. it, it found that 32 city-owned bridges, uh, which is almost one in five, are in critical need of repair. Um, so this was probably on that list, right? It was on that list. Um, so it was already on the long list of bridges to fully rehab. That was going to cost $48 million, or at least estimated Oof. to cost that much, right? Um, the urgent repairs that they have to make in the next few months uh, just to get the bridge open and running again, it's going to be about $1 to $2 million. So um, significantly less, but addressing those critical issues uh, that have to be addressed in mm -hmm. order for it to stay up. <laughs> um, according to this article from WESA, the interim director of the Oakland Planning and Development Cor Corporation, Andrea Boykowicz, said that she heard the bridge could close back in 2018. So that's a while ago. Um, yeah. You know, that these, that these, this bridge has been a concern. Um, but the Ganey administration said on Wednesday that there were previous ins inspections of the Charles Anderson Memorial Bridge, and it didn't indicate a need for closure, but that based on the results of an updated structural analysis, uh, which is what they have been doing last year since the Fern Hollow Bridge collapsed, mm -hmm. um, that this bridge you know, needs to be closed now until the repairs can be made. So I'm not trying to rush them because I understand, <laughs> you know, these overhauls are coming at a significant cost and amount of labor. It's not something that can happen overnight necessarily. Um, but has the mayor said anything about, you know, when they'll start work on the others before something like this happens again? Right now, uh, there's only 11 bridges on that list uh, that were scheduled within the next five years for repairs. And again, the Charles Anderson Bridge was one of them. So the other 21 aren't on that list um, mm. for the next <laughs> five years. Um, this is actually the second major bridge uh, that Mayor Aganey has had to shut down 
in his, you know, year long administration, <laughs> um, city officials closed the Swindell Bridge over I-279 North. That was last summer because pieces of it were falling down mm. below. Yeah. <laughs> onto, so <laughs> onto a highway, right? <laughs> onto the yes, onto the highway below. Luckily, you know, nobody was injured. But um until the repairs are made, you know, basically expect some delays. Uh plan your plan your day, plan your route. And uh, we'll have a link to this article with some suggested detours from city officials in our show notes. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, when you're going across the bridge in Pittsburgh, you're testing your fate. But there are other uh, ways to kind of look into your fate. Do either of you use tarot cards or have you had your tarot cards read? I watch a lot of um, tarot readings online, but I've never uh, gotten it done in person. I'm a little I'm a scaredy cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also I kind of feel like if something horrific is in my future, I'd rather, you know, enjoy my time in blissful ignorance. <laughs> yeah, well, we I think we're all on the same page here. I have not either because I'm also very scared of it. I don't like I don't fully believe in tarot cards, but then I also do. So if anything bad happened to my cards, I would just be anxious the entire time um, being like, when is this going to happen to me? Um, But I've always loved like the art that comes from tarot cards. I think Mm. it's like really beautiful. So when I saw in like a great article in City Paper that a local artist in Pittsburgh Genevieve Barbie Turner, she's also known as Killer Pancake Illustration, was making a deck of cards based on Southwestern Pennsylvania, East Ohio, and West Virginia folklore and history. I got really excited just about like seeing what what could possibly be in her project. What kind of uh, folklore is she using? Is Bigfoot making a comeback? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, the Laurel Highlands Bigfoot rumors aside, that myth is not specific to this region. But another crowd favorite from this region, Mothman, will be included alongside Mm. other mythical beings like the Squonk. The (laughs) Squonk? Come again? (laughs) Um, So that's a creature that like started popping up in books in like the 1910s. It's not super well known. Um, It's like a northeastern Pennsylvania cryptid in like the hemlock forest. It's a wrinkly, ugly animal, kind of looks like a pig um, that apparently cries all the time. My ex. uh, Because it's... (laughs) uh, Because it's so ugly. Um, uh, And like causes like little creaks and, you know, puddles and and sort of stuff. Um, Besides your ex, have you guys, um, (laughs) have you or uh, have you, Morgan or Mallory, ever seen one? I've seen some weird things driving around (laughs) Western Pennsylvania. I I do stand by the fact that I I thought I saw a wild boar once, but Mm. I've never seen a squonk. Well, and if I see a squonk, um, CityCast Pittsburgh will be the first to know. Uh, I have not. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, de- the deck isn't just focused on like cryptids and these sort of like mythical creatures. Um, she has their cards dedicated to pieces of like folklore from the region and like moments in our history. The pig lady of Canatone, she's a real life woman who's actually murdered um, in Butler County, decapitated. Uh, and there's a ghost story about her that um, she's her ghost is wandering around looking for her head. And in the mm. meantime, she put a pig head on top. So um, that's one of the cards. There's Madame Bartel, who's um, the, the Millvale psychic. And then Fanny Sellens, a labor organizer for the United Mining Workers of America, who in 1919 uh, was killed by Pinkerton agents outside of a Breckenridge PA mine. So it's a really broad and complex and really interesting history to kind of like be using in this tarot uh, method. Yeah, that that is quite a wide range from like maybe a fictional ugly pig type creature to like <laughs> somebody who actually was really tragically killed trying to organize mm. for workers' rights. Mm-hmm. That's quite a span. Yeah. So it's she's done like a ton of research on this to kind of um, find all of these characters. According to their Kickstarter, the uh, card set is 78 cards, which is like a ton of ton of things to kind of look into. She's working with a uh, generational intuitive tarot reader on some of the more like tarot elements of um, making sure that it kind of fits within that medium. Mm. Um, But she's also, you know, uh, looking in Carnegie Library collections, online archives, talking to locals, um, including interviewing like an author and archivist who wrote uh, Witches of Pennsylvania, Occult History and Lore. So it's a really Mm. well, like well researched document that you can buy about our region and the mythos surrounding it. 
I actually uh, know Genevieve and contacted her before for for something on here, but d- hmm. did she explain why tarot? It was one of the most interesting things about the article in City Paper. Uh, and tarot is kind of her preferred uh, medium. She's done several other sets in tarot. I actually have a clip from her Kickstarter, so I'm going to play you guys a clip. Our deck's theme taps into the very unique history and culture of this region of Appalachia. We're highlighting the people, the places, and the history, but connecting it with the universal truths of life, love, and death that anybody can appreciate. It is a daunting but a thrilling task. So if somebody wanted to get their hands on one of these decks, maybe this will be the turning point for us, um, <laughs> willing to look into the future if it means seeing some of these mythical creatures. How, uh, how can you get your hands on them? Yeah, so I've been considering buying one, um, even though I'm scared of tarot, just because the art is so stunning. Uh, I would recommend all of you look it up. Um, but you can currently purchase their sets on Kickstarter. Uh, it will be live through February 10th. Um, and so I think the reason why they're using Kickstarter is so that they can kind of guesstimate how many sets they need to print, send it out to the printer. So um, you won't get them for a while. They'll be mailed out by December. Um, but you can also, you know, pay an extra $190 to become a card or Ooh. like, you know, you could become Mothman. Or if you have a story that you want her to make a card of, like your own Pennsylvania Appalachia a folklore tale, you could kind of get her to do that as well. So Ooh. yeah, I don't know. I feel like being Mothman is a little bit of a dream come true. I don't know about you guys. I'm trying to think of some other Appalachian folklores. I keep thinking of the guy that bends the steel outside of the... Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Steely McBeam, but that's a different man of steel. <laughs> Equally mythical and powerful, though. Steely McBeam, the last Western Pennsylvania cryptid. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Our team this week includes Mallory Falk, Francesca DeBecco, Elizabeth Kama, Meg Dalton, Lizzie Goldsmith, and me, Morgan Moody. The tunes are by Benji. And we'll be back on Monday with more news from around the city, so we'll see you then. I am, I am... (laughs) Behind the scenes dying. Um, if you- <laughs> oh, okay.